Okay, I think we're going to get started. First of all, let me thank each and every one of you for after two full days, some, in some cases three full days, of Jenkins training and workshops and sessions and exhibits and eating and drinking and everything mm -hmm. to come here at, at uh, 345 on the last day of the show. I, you're all champs in my book, and thank you very much for showing up. My name's Alan Schimmel. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of DevOps.com, and um, I'm moderating today's expert panel. And we, we have a full panel, actually, of real live experts that I think you're going to find uh, very informative, and hopefully we'll have a nice conversation. But, you know, these panels and conversations are only as good as the audience participation. So we have, hopefully, we'll have time at the end, and I'm looking forward to hearing maybe some comments, questions of our panel. Um, so please feel free to uh, contribute at, at the time, at questions time. With that, being start, with that being said, let's get started. So this is an expert panel, and, and the uh, topic of today's panel is continuous delivery and DevOps in the enterprise. And of course, that sounds like a really big title, but it, let me try to focus you in on where we in the panel and I discussions prior to today, what we wanted to focus in on. And what I wanted to focus in on today was the biggest question I hear at DevOps.com from practitioners, from organizations around DevOps, and that is, yeah, this all sounds great. How do we get started? What, what are the, what's the pathway? What's the roadmap? You know, all this culture stuff, I hear it, you know, I know all these tools, I've heard of Jenkins, I've heard of CloudBees and CD, and I, maybe I know Puppet or Chef or Ansible or something, but how do we get started? Who, who, who in the organization leads it, right? And the purpose of today's panel is, as I explained to our panel members, is each one of these folks have, have been through some DevOps transformation at their organization. And their organizations are very similar to your organizations, right? One of the nice things about coming to a conference like this is you get the I'm not alone feeling, right? I'm not, I'm not the weirdo or our organization isn't so crazy that we're the only ones doing this. There are lots of organizations that are going through the same things you're going through, facing the same challenges you're facing, dealing with the same issues and problems that you may be dealing with. And the idea here is, I call it the idiot tax, right? What can we, how can we help save you from paying the idiot tax, from making kind of rookie mistakes or obvious mistakes that are not insurmountable, but delay you, cost you money, cost you momentum, cost time, right? And each of these esteemed panel members are going to give you a little bit of their own experiences and things that they did in paying the idiot tax that maybe will save you the time and energy of, of committing the same mistakes, okay? With that said, let me introduce our panel. So dead center, well, not dead center, but almost in the center, we have uh, Bikash Roy Chaudhary, uh, Principal Architect of NetApp, Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining this panel. Uh, and to the right, to the right of Bikash is a gentleman I've had the pleasure of working with at conferences before, Nirmal, Nirmal Mehta. Uh, Nirmal's with Booz Allen Hamilton. Hello, everybody. Thank Thanks you, for Nirmal. being here. And then to, well, a little bit to, her le to their left is Samantha Oyen. Samantha's with General Mills, a developer at General Mills. Samantha. Hello. You can call me Sam. Too. Sam, well, yeah, she's introduced herself as Sam. And then next to Sam is our friend Wynn. Wynn Yu is with Twitter, so a real life unicorn. Hello, everybody, <laughs> welcome. And then, not but certainly not last, but certainly not least on the far end, we have Wes Gaddis from TIAA. Wes? Hello. Okay. So that's our panel, guys, and we're, we're going to get started here. Alan. Oh, my God, did we forget someone? Yes. Vishal. I skipped him. You did. Vishal's not really on the panel, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess they didn't tell him. Um, just go to HR with your laptop. Uh, 
Sitting next to us, we have Vishal Rana. Rana. Hi. Welcome. From Adobe. <laughs> Thank you. Vishal is always on the panel, my mistake. Um, anyway, okay, let, let's get started with our panel then. So each one of you have, have um, been through DevOps transformation at your organization. Some of you are further along that transformation than others, right? But what I'd like us to do is if we can start with each one of you maybe giving us one example of a lesson learned, right? Sort of an idiot tax paid or a lesson learned that will help maybe someone sitting in the audience who's sitting there and says, oh yeah, that's us. And, and we can just, and then we'll, we'll have the panel, we'll go one, let the panel discuss it, and then the next one, and we'll go down the line. Wu, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, okay. So I'm from Twitter, and uh, but I joined Twitter only like when I said Wu. I'm sorry. Uh, I joined Twitter about three months ago, so I don't know much. Uh, I haven't. I, I'm still start learning about Twitter, how things go. Um, for the lesson, and I probably will refer to what I learned from my previous company, not at Twitter. Is just how to get people understanding how uh, how to drive the CI/CD at the corporate level, how to balance the um, the, the CTO office offering of CICD and uh, meet the individual application needs to achieve their speed and quality of the code delivery. Mm -hmm. So what, what, can you give us a little, so that was the issue, yeah. and kind of how did you guys deal with it over there? Um, there's no easy way to get out of it. it, it, it just the need to really understand the challenges people are facing. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a hardware issue, sometimes architecture issue, sometimes it's uh, tooling, uh, we're missing testing, all, all, all those kind of things. And uh, identify those gaps and identify the, um, the options we have to overcome those challenges. Yes. Yeah. So anybody on the panel want to comment on that? Sure. Um, NetApp and being a story in data management company, a lot of, a lot of people may think that we are anyway different um, or maybe in the same boat, but yes, uh, our applications <coughs> has been traditionally huge and humongous and monolithic if you look into our operating system. But over the last year and a half, or maybe a little more than that, we have slowly started to modularize a lot of our applications. And the first thing we started to do was to standardize a lot of our tools, the integrations that we are planning to do. And just like Mo mentioned, uh, we also have a lot of challenges internally, culturally too, uh, because our development centers are dispersed globally, and we are not only located here in Sunnyvale, but we are, we are having in uh, Bangalore and other locations across the globe. So how do we actually collaborate between all the teams and make sure that the release cadence that we have, that is the outcome of what the agile workflows that we are planning to move forward to in the DevOps process or practice, um, the outcome is obviously going to be a lot more faster in the release cadence. So what we have made an attempt so far is to structure around how we approach this. And that structuring has taken us a, a long time. And I think that is a part of the heavy lifting that all organizations, uh, the mid and the large organizations in the enterprise space go through. And I have been interfacing with a lot of other enterprise accounts too, and they have a similar feedback as what we are going through right now. But I think uh, adapting and starting to measure the, the gaps that we are having and trying to um, react to that and uh, find out a solution towards moving towards is what it is right now. And then once we, I think some part of our business is slowly moving towards the, uh, the agile workflows and the DevOps practice, and a lot of them are still to catch up at this time. So I wouldn't say that we are um, already in a, in a place where we can say that we can declare victory, but we are already in a path uh, of, um, of, of driving the DevOps practice uh, in our organization, but there are a lot of things that we can possibly do. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, um, I'm Sam from General Mills. Uh, so the, the point that we're kind of at at General Mills is trying to introduce the culture change for CI and not really down to C, CD yet. We have one-click deployments, but um, it's not really that, that pipeline. Um, and I think the hardest part, or the most beneficial thing for us 
is that you need to get other developers buy-in, especially for CI. Like, if you're measuring quality of code on check-in, like, it doesn't do anything unless developers care about it. And the most effective thing that we've done, and I'm on the team that kind of initialized Jenkins um, and is, is setting it up and maintaining it, is just like, eat your own dog food or drink your own champagne or whatever you wanna say, but um, try out those practices of like actually paying attention to those CI metrics and software quality metrics and see how it improves your code and your team practices and how often you're able to deploy um, securely and then kind of like show that with other developers because you need to get them excited about doing it and to do that, you need to show them a successful example of it. So I think that's the first step and then obviously like getting business buy-in is huge because they're gonna have to allocate time to like actually pay attention to software quality but I think starting small with one team is, is a really huge uh, way to gain like momentum. Hi, uh, so one of the key things which I learned during uh, transformations that the other companies or organizations I have been with is if you are trying to do the DevOps transformation, just do it. don't think you are alone. Make sure you don't have silos around. You talk to your developers, to the QAs, and make sure the uh, uh, leadership has a buy-in uh, because without having those people together and do it iteratively, see if you are, uh, you are enrolling any new automation or you are doing any new pipeline implementation. Do the people like it? Don't force on them because uh, otherwise there's a much bigger risk of failure. So taking everybody as much as you can, of course you cannot take everybody on board all the time, but helping them um, like try to see uh, what they really need and try to cater that rather than solve your own problems. Having a feedback mechanism and leadership buying will be a key thing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Wes Gaddis and I'm with TIAA. Uh, we're a large financial institution. The company's been around almost 100 years now. So uh, for the companies out there that you represent that are maybe larger or lend or more legacy, there's a lot of inherent problems that come with, with just being that. And, and whether it be trying to move over to a true CICD type of uh, framework for you know, delivering software or whatever the case may be. Now, we had some unique challenges as well. One that kind of coincides with what's been mentioned here is we were focusing on a particular area of the pipeline that was the, the CI portion and getting that up and getting that going. And there really wasn't what you would call an overall mission statement or adoption at what you call the executive level. And so before we realized it, there were rogue or islands of little DevOps operations that have popped up all over the company. And now we find ourselves having to bring them in to the fold, if you would, as we try to build out the entire pipeline to bring that consistency, that approach. Now, one size doesn't fit all. We got a team over here that is re-engineering their entire platform for microservices. Great, they're leveraging Docker, they're doing all kinds of fun stuff. We got a team over here which is still dealing with batch processing as part of their uh, delivery cycle. But the problem that we ran into is there wasn't a uniform approach from the beginning. So if you're in a position to influence or be thought leadership is get on top of it right away from the top down. And even though not everybody might take the same approach, at least you work together in step and you don't have one team going on GitHub, one going on Bitbucket, you have one doing Nexus and one doing Artifactory. And before you know it, you've got a pile of a mess in terms of trying to straighten it all out and getting uh, more consistency across the organization. We're dealing with that now. And I see heads nodding out there. <laughs> So I got a twofer. Um, you get a 50% discount on this advice. So um, the first one is, um, so ha who here has gone to one of the pipeline demos or looked at the new like uh, Blue Ocean stuff? Pretty cool, right? So there's like these labels at the top, like build and then test and then deploy. 
How many of those, how many people here are those the labels of departments that you have? Internally. Oh, not that many. Well, then you're, you're already doing it. You should be up here on the panel. Oh, okay. There we go. So, and in a lot of the organizations um, I work with, uh, normal at, at Booz Allen, um, we, we're mostly focused on the public sector. And um, if you think your organizations are large, I'm pretty sure I have a client that's bigger. Um, so we have whole entire departments, armies, if you will, dedicated to each one of those labels, right? And so the challenge is, if you have that in your organization, no amount of technology is gonna fix that. What I mean is, if you wanna do continuous delivery, or continuous integration even, you have to invest in breaking down the barriers between those, those organizations. So you might have a friend at the QA you know, department, you might have a friend in the testing department, a friend in the user acceptance department, you know, Go grab some coffee and start the conversation about how can we get a small change automated through this without having to go through how you did it in the past. The world we live in today, there's, there's a large separation between the companies that will be successful at, that, at doing that and breaking down those barriers and the ones that are sticking to and not changing. And I don't know which side you wanna be on, but it's pretty clear that folks like WEN's organizations they know how to quickly get change through these pipelines. I'm pretty sure they don't have meetings between their QA teams and, well, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, but I'm, I'm sure they don't have like gigantic meetings between these departments every year to figure out how they can work better. Just do it, do it small. Get it. How quickly can you get a comma onto your app? You know, how can you can change a period from a period to a comma? How quickly can you get that change through? And that will give you an indicator to where the problems that you need to get solved first before you actually start investing and in, in learning in the cloud bees and Docker and all this kind of cool stuff. The second one, and this is something Sam raised, um, we kind of live in a, the, the main problem we face is that we're all humans. We have to actually deal with other humans, right? If it was just computers talking to computers, it'd be all automated. Um, so, how can you align you, those teams to actually start adopting these practices? And you can do a little bit, you know, we have these brains and we have these biases in there, these cognitive kind of problems. And that's kind of what we're up against, but you can actually use those to your advantage. So Gene Kim kind of talks about this in his DevOps stuff too, but I've actually implemented it in some of our projects, which is um, how many people ha here have a change control board that they have to go through? Okay. So we had the same requirements. So what we said was if you store all your configuration as code and put it through our Jenkins pipeline, you don't have to go through change control board. And that means that there's, a, there's like an incentive. You don't have to have that meeting. You don't have to fill out any of the forms. But that allows our operations team to, to ensure that we can reliably operate it. But if you wanted to, if you didn't do that, then you had to go through a two-week change control board. So you can use these kind of incentives to align and speed up and, for lack of a better term, trick your teams into doing the, the right thing, the you know, copyrighted right thing. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. I have one more thing to add is really about developer experience. As we're driving the transformation, driving the change to DevOps, whatever, we want to make sure developers are um, productive and, uh, and happy with their day-to-day -day operation. And, uh, Having developer as a focus, as our customer to drive this CICD is key to part of the success as well. So I, I'd like to, I'm just gonna jump in and try to steer us here a little bit if you don't mind. You know, when, so when we look, when we look at the, the title of the panel here, it's continuous delivery and DevOps in the enterprise. And, and you know, that begs the question of continuous delivery and DevOps is different in a small business, not in an enterprise setting, right? And, and what we have here is enterprise settings. But what, what do we really mean when we, we talk about enterprise? Yeah, Twitter's a big company. General Mills is a huge company. You know, and there's bigger units within DOD and the federal space that I'm sure Nermal deals with. But there are certain characteristics that if you don't have those characteristics, this stuff doesn't even pop up. And, and so one of the kind of pattern, patterns that I've seen in, in talking, and I'm interested in what you guys are, is it, and I think Wes hit it on the end, is what I call pockets of DevOps, right? Where you have pockets, you have small teams with at, dispersed through this giant enterprise doing their own thing that they call DevOps, 
right? And maybe one's using Jenkins. Maybe another one actually bought a CloudBees Enterprise license, and the people using Jenkins don't even know it's available to them, right? Or, or um, you know, that one's using Puppet, one's using Ansible, and there's just these pockets of DevOps. And I think the difference between using open source, pure open source tools, is that's okay in the pockets of DevOps. Let me just put this out there and you guys comment on it. That's okay in the, in the pockets of DevOps model, right? You just want to use Jenkins, let's say. And I've got six different teams using six different Jenkins and, you know, implementations. At some point, though, if you're going to be a real grown-up enterprise, that has, to, that has to be more centralized. That has to be more put together, right? Coordinated, I guess, is the word. And I think that's what we talk about when we talk about CD, CI, DevOps in the enterprise, is this, this coming together of these pockets of DevOps, right? And I, I just ask the audience, how many of you are in the pockets of DevOps stage Right? Probably most of us still. And how many of us have reached nirvana, right, of, hey, we, we've centralized now? Okay. And I think, yeah, a little bit. But that, so that's one of the, the main things. And I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, panelists, on, on that very topic. Wes, you're ready. Well, yeah, I'm ready. That's, I was leaning forward because I was going to knock his hand down if he went for it. Uh. Um, <laughs> is that wrong? Oh, okay, good. You know, we, we, we have that challenge, but we recently we had some new management come in that had a good idea, and it, it makes a lot of sense, and that is, one, we're turning a lot of the source code that we develop for it, whether it be utilities, like we use Gradle as our build engine, things of that nature, but we customize it to a degree. What we've decided to do is, one, we're, we've approached it, we're turning our code into open source. So we're allowing all the DevOps teams, you know, to be able to obviously uh, develop some of their own solutions, but of course they have to do the pull request or if you're using uh, the merge request, as we call it in GitLab, right, to be able to add. So we're taking advantage of the 3,000 plus developers we have, you know, both onshore and offshore. And we're doing the same kind of model for all these pockets of DevOps teams. We're instead of fighting them, we're saying, well, you know, if we can't beat you, we're going to join you. So instead, we're reaching out and saying, you're now part of our team. And we're leveraging them. And so as we work with all these different teams, they all have something to good to offer. And then we actually start assigning out different uh, projects, if you would, or, or areas of the pipeline that we want to build, or we ask them to POC a particular piece of the pipeline. And they're more willing and ready to do that. It's just a matter of reaching out and working to them. So it's almost like a federated model. And then at the core of DevOps, that's really what DevOps is. It's development and operations working together for the same purpose, and that is to speed up the delivery of your software to market. Anyone else? Want yeah. To comment? Uh, you go ahead. So basically, uh, I have seen these pockets many, many times, and I one of the core things I do is if I find a person. I go and ask him, like, if we are offering you a Jenkins, which has the security enabled, LDAP authentication, and all the uh, plugins configured, what's that? It's stopping you from using that. And there, there can be really simple answers, like, I want the root access, or I, I don't like the port you're running on, or I want this particular automation. Like, hey, I can solve that, but if this only happens like Nirmal said, uh, you don't need to do it in isolation. Hey, I offered you, and this is the best. This is what you have to use it. Tell me what you want, and these can be simple configuration fixes if you have the right tool set along uh, the continuous integration. So like, if you don't like the, you want just HTTPS 443 port, sure, I can do that. I can implement some HA proxy or something. Having uh, one of the other things which I wanted to add uh, here was uh, DevOps without having the right tool set uh, uh, won't be possible if you cannot have uh, an API or you don't have a single click uh, where the deployments come through. You still have to put in a ticket, and wait for three days and follow up what happens. That's going to be a killer. So uh, as a the team uh, shared services which offers solutions, 
please do think how easy, sh sit into the developers or the QA's shoes and see how much does it take him to get the service he needs? Can he get it instantaneously or does he wait for a couple of uh, days or three days? That kills the purpose. Over to you. Yeah, I just have to add a couple of things here. Um, Alan brought up a point about enterprise and then also DevOps, pockets of DevOps. And we are enterprise and we also have pockets of DevOps. There are a few things which I really would like to share here. First of all, um, I have seen various different tools being used by different teams since uh, small, uh, small teams scattered ac across the organization. They say, oh, we are all doing DevOps and we have got this uh, CI and CD built into the pipeline. We are doing great. And they could be using open source software too. Then all of a sudden there is a realignment happening. Teams merge and uh, they become part of a bigger team. Um, or they are completely broken off and dissolved. And then when the merging happens, it says the uh, team leader or the, or the leader of the team says, well, we already have a standard form and process of delivering this in the CI CD pipeline. We would like to merge your part of your code set into this and you follow these guidelines. So that is a common scenario that has been happening in a lot of these organizations that I've been speaking internally also at NetApp. The other aspect is when you speak enterprise, there is a supportability factor. How much amount of open source code you would be having. You have to also get the supportability factor because you don't have the skill set to maintain that, neither the resources to sustain it. So with a very so-string budget that you would be having, or even the resources that could be supporting that, that's a huge limitation. So that is also another factor that normally organizations fight the battle as to how do I actually get into the, in a common ground and a, a standard set of tools for where we can actually launch our CI CD process. Because you can't just be saying, hey, my tools are the greatest one. We spend about six months setting this up. And now, because of the realignment, I have to reset everything and I follow your process. Well, that is the reality today in corporate America and elsewhere also across the globe. Because when there is a realignment, you're part of a bigger team, you got to be following certain rules and guidance they're having. And they, they have to merge it. And then comes, again, the supportability aspect of it. So those, these are the few key aspects which the decision makers actually fight, apart from standardizing tools and trying to put a CI CD platform also on. Yeah, I, I would just add that as part of the enter, enterprise uh, centralized CI organization, um, the value is that having a innovative and best of the industry solution it, uh, it is our mission of our team to constantly um, follow the industry best practice and leveraging the industry best technology because in our CICD space, the DevOps space is changing very fast and uh, require a you know, full-time attention to. So, uh, if we do it as a pocket DevOps, it usually happens is they make things working for them and uh, leave it alone for quite, quite a period of time and then over time that thing does not work out. You know have a centralized team really proactively address this need to continuously improve the solution, you know, not just happy what we are today, but also shooting for the uh, requirement that we need to deliver for the, for the future. So, um, sorry, Sam. Um, so, if you're asking, if you're on the fence between using the open source and then transitioning to enterprise or thinking about it or not thinking about it, there's two essential questions you have to ask yourself. One is, if I remove Jenkins from my environment tomorrow, what would fail? And if you're starting to do CI, CD, that would probably be everything. So now you have something that's core to maintain your business. That's a good reason to support it. Second thing is, if there, now that core central thing, that's a pretty big security kind of space. If it's interacting with thousands of systems, it's got logins and service accounts, it has automated ability to read and write to data anywhere. And if there's some vulnerability, are you gonna be the one that looks up that pull request on the Jenkins open source and monitors that for the security patch? Or do you wanna get a nice lovely support email saying, hey, please support, you know, please migrate to the newest version for such a critical thing. Now, if you have an organization that has the ability to scale out 
and support it yourself, and by all means. But, you know, we're not all unicorns and have amazing engineers that have dedicated time to find out every little Java bug in Jenkins. So the real world is that you don't. So that's a really good reason as you mature your CI CD pipeline to get support. In the government space, or in a public sector space, it's actually contractually obligated to get commercial support, or you have to prove that you have the money and resources to keep to maintain an open source project. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a huge undertaking, and, and that's kind of what uh, my team looks at, is making sure like Jenkins is healthy, Jenkins is working, Jenkins is useful for the developers, and that's where it becomes hard to merge a bunch of DevOps pockets into one kind of centralized DevOps team that's still providing value to a bunch of different teams that have a bunch of different requirements. So like, I know one of my biggest struggles um, admining our Jenkins instance, we have the enterprise instance, but it's uh, securing it enough to know, okay, this is passing out audit requirements, um, we are making sure we're still running like these mandatory uh, security scans for all of our projects that we had with our old system, but also developers have the freedom to run tests that are important to that specific project and the technologies they're using on that project. And I shouldn't have brought this up because I don't have a current solution, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things that Jenkins um, Jenkins offers, and that's kind of the stage that we're at too, is like exploring, like right now we have everything locked down to um, like one template. Um, and developers can put in basically like the path to source control and like um, where they want it deployed, and that's like what they get to do. If they want um, the JavaScript test runner to not be chutzpah and be karma, like they can't, they don't have the freedom to do that. So like that's one of the biggest challenges that we're working on because like we talk about all these DevOps pockets being bad, but it like in my mind it's like kind of necessary sometimes because teams are so different. And also there's new, also there's new technology came, came out and we have to support those new yeah. things. Yeah. So exactly. uh, when, can you, if you don't mind, can you describe your environment because I think um, sure. It's an interesting kind of take on this. Sure. At, at Twitter, we have the environment, and uh, we have a managed CI that, that uh, you know, our team defined the um, release pipeline from checking all the way to ready for production. And we, um, given that Twitter is a startup and uh, kind of young, and we, 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 we had an advantage to do the thing right at first time. <laughs> and uh, so um, we have a robust Jenkins environment that all the configuration and uh, settings is stored in a, both a CM as well as the database. So whenever the things go wrong, we can actually quickly, quickly restore that. At the same time, we all also offer a custom CI solution so that when, when customers have um, new, the latest technology that, that the standard managed CI does not support, we, we allow them to we support, enable them to, to build their own CI jobs and, uh, and running on our platform. So, so we, we have, both the standard and customers. Normal. Yes. So we, unfortunately, as often happens with these panels, we have about five minutes, I think, on our time. Wow. I went Ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, I, I apologize. But I have more questions that I wanted <laughs> to put. But I also, it is important that I wanted to save time for the audience for their input. Yeah. So um, if you don't have questions, I have more stuff we can talk about. But... I'm gonna give some questions. You know what, can I grab your mic? Yep. Who has a question? All the way in the back. All right. I'll do All my Phil Donahue back. imitation here. Who remembers Phil Donahue? Yeah, you do, come on. Here you go. <laughs> this might be a little slightly off topic, but from a DevOps and a CD perspective, how are people handling SOX and audit compliance issues? Because clearly there's got to be a stopgap or something to that nature in order for somebody that has the yeah. authority to approve that to move forward. Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't know if we've had a lot of success with it, but I will say, being a financial institution, we do deal with SOX, SAS 70, and all those other type of, you know, compliant audit, you know, regulations that come into place. 
And yeah, it's, a, it's been a real challenge. In fact, they're the ones that currently are, are, are proving to be some of the biggest challenges we have in being able to move code to production. Move it around internally, low test environments, high level, not a big deal. Getting into prod is a huge challenge, and we haven't, uh, we haven't cleared that hurdle yet. So I guess I just wasted about 30 seconds of everybody's time. <laughs> so, um, doing, <laughs> thanks, Wes. Um, so, uh, you know, working with a public sector, I basically live in the world of compliance. That's the majority of the work we do. I would turn that question around. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think the CI/CD story in DevOps is actually a savior for the compliance and security story. And it's because it's forcing the conversation to start earlier in the process. When I started working at Booz Allen, it was typical for the compliance and all that kind of stuff to happen at the end of a project. And we prided ourselves on entertain, like entertaining the, the security team early on on a project because we knew that we didn't want to extend the, the timeline of the project for another six months after we're ready. So what, we, what we've seen is that you can nowadays put enough tooling in place to catch the compliance issues on smaller changes earlier on in your pipeline. Think of it, move, wherever your compliance is right now, put it in the, put it like right after linting or something crazy shift it, like that. Shift it left. Yeah, shift it all the way left as much as possible and gain trust, like make that visible to the security team. Make, make it completely, like they should have a Jenkins login. They can see what's going on in the pipeline. But at the same time, it's, it's, not good that we have, so how many here have something like Nessus running? And that's like another team runs the security vulnerability scans or something like that. Are the developers allowed to see the reports? Uh, do they have access to Nessus? No, why? So you're, you're having developers that are responsible for making secure code where they don't even know what the rules of the game are. They should, the first thing you do when you get back next, next Monday to your office is ask your security team to open up the read-only Nessus reports back to the developers on your current builds because they need to know what their, what their program, like what the problems are. Do you understand what I'm kind of going with that? Yeah, but if they told you that, then they would know nothing. <laughs> um, but but the, it's kind of like you need that feedback loop. So I, you know, my background is in security and compliance. I spent about 15, 16 years in that. And I will tell you that, that when we talk about SOCs, HIPAA, PCI, SAS 70, and these things, DevOps is, can be security and compliance's best friend. Because what most of these things want are strong process-driven processes, right? And, and policies that we follow. And when we do automation, and when we do these things in process, it actually can help your audit, it can help when the auditor comes in and they, do you have a process for when you're scanning code? Yeah, and it, and it can help. And it generated this guy's question. We're gonna give him a chance to comment. Okay, we, we answered that question. We're going to a new question. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, so, um, I'm at BlackRock. We have uh, a lot of developers. We've got like at least 2,000 developers. Can you hear me, sorry? We have, I'm, I'm at BlackRock, we have at least 2,000 developers, and we have a, kind of a, an interesting challenge where we had established consistency as a, as a first, uh, first principle many, many years ago. And um, you know, there was one build system, one, you know, one platform by which all the different developers would go through and execute their SDLC. Um, very consistent, super consistent. Uh, over time, what has happened is that, you know, it's, it's, it's got some cobwebs on it, right? We're trying to like, you know, make it um, better, faster, neater, right? Like DevOps, right? We want to do that. What we're finding is that people are going out and coming up, creating, creating pockets of DevOps, as, as you say, right? Like, and so people are coming up with their new, their new platforms, their new kind of things. And we're, you know, we're doing what you say. We're trying to pull those people in and say, hey, guess what? You're the build team, you're part of the, the DevOps team, right? Um, but I think part of it too is that the challenge that we're facing is that developers have a lot, very loud voice and you know what, what they want is what they want, right? And so what we're trying to do is give them uh, you know, a lot of what they want and management is hearing this. Management is saying, you know what, developers want this. We want developers happy, but at the same time, consistency is super important, right? Like we have to retain consistency. We do have tremendous audit requirements, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
So just wanted to get your take uh, on the balance between consistency of platform uh, versus like giving the people what they want. So <laughs> do you, is your consistent platform that you've had for a while, is that just custom code? Like that's an application that you guys built that no one else has access to contribute to? Everyone has access to contribute to it. Well, then they should contribute to it. They should. I agree with you. But um, you know what people are doing? It's it's not very shiny. You know, it's like it's you know, very, very, very yeah. old. And like and now, I'm sorry. No, uh, sorry. Okay, so we, we kind of have the same thing at General Mills. We have like a 12-year-old build and deploy system that's actually pretty awesome for how old it is. Like one click builds, deploys. You can get to fraud in five minutes. Like no big deal. But um, it was like, first of all, we didn't let them... Uh, change the source code, so good on you. But um, like what we were seeing was it's like, it's harder to add features to that crusty old code. So I totally sympathize with that and that's why we decided to shift to Jenkins. Um, and we actually don't really have the problem where developers are like going off in their own pockets. Like they're good listeners apparently at General Mills. Like they're like, what, we have to use this? Okay, we'll use it. Um, I, think it's I think, yeah, I think it's Minnesota. Is anyone here from Minnesota? Oh, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. Minnesota, nice, you betcha. Um, yeah, but I think, I think it really is, like, at some point, you just need to reevaluate, like, what can we put in front of them that they're gonna, that's flexible enough for them to play with, that's gonna, um, that's gonna solve their needs? And I think it's, like, two-factor. Like, one, yeah, you need to, like, gather up what their actual problems are to, like, assess that and be, like, is it Jenkins, is it... I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything besides Jenkins here. But um, another thing is is that like actually being realistic about it too because I think, um, I don't know, like people will kind of always complain with anything you give them, at least like in my experience. So like also like getting everyone's feedback but then like obviously you have a really smart team that's like built this other platform like use your best judgment on like what is a good amount of freedom to give them? What can enable them to be like the best developers they can be? I'm sorry, Sam, we, I'm just being reminded that we're out of time here. We've come to our end, but we could do this for two hours, but most of you probably want to go do something else. This section is the best. We should have done yeah, this but there's always a balance to be struck between developer freedom and conformity with the empire. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> You know, I am your father. But anyway, we, we need to call this a wrap. So first of all, I want, to thank, I want to thank all of you for coming in at the end of the day today. Thank you very much. But also want to thank each of our panelist members. I'll try, I'm going to start with Vishal so I don't, don't forget him. Wes, Nermo, Sam, Dakash, and Wen. Okay. I, all right, thank you all very much for a great panel. I hope you enjoyed this panel. Hope you enjoyed Jenkins Days. And we'll see you, uh, you can see us on DevOps.com actually. But we'll, if not, we'll see you at the next Jenkins World.